Will you stand and sing with us? Oh, baby. 
morning. I'd like to welcome you all here today. Uh, Brian and Barb are enjoying a getaway and they'll be back next week. The day become, starts one of two weeks of what we're going to call the homecoming series. Uh, my son Brennan is going to be bringing the message today. We'd like to invite you back next week as uh, Roy and Chris's son Travis will bring the message next week. An announcement handed to me by Jack and Kathy Hall says that Joy class will meet at the Brooklyn Library on Tuesday evening, October 11th, not this Tuesday, but a week from Tuesday at 7.30. Roll call is a different name for the devil. Uh, another announcement handed to me is that uh, President Marvin has uh, announced we're going to have a CIA class meeting in Potluck, Potluck next uh, Sunday after church. So uh, please plan to attend that. Otherwise, I'd like to remind you about the Rake and Run coming up. Uh, I think that's October 19th. And there's sign-up sheets out there to sign up for the, to help out the football concession stand and for those signing up to make chili. So other than that, we're glad that you're here today. I'll turn it over to Craig. Uh, it's prayer time. Um, there are a number of individuals within our church and those within our community that we should be in prayer for today. Uh, mentioned for the first time this week um, uh, was John Manat who passed away. Uh, his funeral will be Monday. Uh, reception, or excuse me, the visitation uh, with family will be um, this afternoon at the Manat building, uh, their corporate building. Um, are there others that we should think of today in prayer? David? Richard. Uh, Richard Carmichael um, has cancer. Uh, we'd like for you to include him in your prayers. Are there others? If not, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, you know that what the requests are from each one of us even more than we do. Lord, we're thankful for the sunshine and the beauty of the harvest in the fall. We're, we're thankful that you bless us with those. We ask that you be with those that are harvesting throughout the fall. You with, be with our families that are traveling to or from wherever they go. We ask that uh, you be with Brendan today as he delivers a message and we ask that it will move the hearts of all of us. Give him the strength that he needs. Uh, we know that it's sometimes harder to speak to the audience you grew up with. So we ask Lord that you give him that strength that he needs. We Lord, we pray that um, through the worship today, we will be moved to closer to you and know that the love that you have on each one of us. Lord, be with those families that we've mentioned. Uh, be with Richard Carmichael as he battles with cancers and challenged with that. Lord, we know there are many others that have cancer and diseases that only you can provide the comfort for. Lord, these things we ask for in your name. Amen. As we come to communion time today, uh, praise the name of the Lord our God is, is a song that uh, we're going to sing. We ask that you be in prayer for communion as we sing this song together.
please pray with me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we certainly thank you for what you did. You sent your only Son to come and die for each one of us, give us that hope of eternal life. And Lord, as we gather around your table at this time, you've given us semblance to remember you by because we so often forget to we forget. So as we take up these emblems, we remember Christ's body that was broken for each of us. As we drink of the cup, we also remember the blood that was shed for each of us. Lord, through Christ, God, through Christ, you opened the doorway, you tore the veil, so we might come in your presence. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for this day to come in this house to worship you. We thank you for all the gifts that you give to each and every one of us. Lord, I ask that you bless these gifts that you are about to receive and use them away the best of your needs. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
I'd like to welcome to the speak to us today our son Brendan. Uh, we got about four pictures, but in those pictures we grabbed some other kids too. But VBS there, I don't know if uh, this is where he was with us in 2005, uh, helping lead music during the summer 2005 after attending one year at NCC. That was a youth Sunday, uh, that particular Sunday, Micaiah and and uh, Bradley Crady were baptized and stuff. What else we got? And I think, uh, Kelly, do you recognize yourself as Kelsey and Kelly are up there at Brennan as he led songs for VBS. And so some memories going back. But uh, Brendan uh, attended NCC. Uh, uh, he stayed at NCC until he, uh, let me reword this. One of the greatest times I appreciate is when he was on New Way Singers and he, he got up and went forward at the end of their concert and he said, I want to dedicate my life to God. So uh, I thought that brought me a lot of joy. I think one of Patty's greatest joys when he called mom and said, hey, I found a girl I like. And uh, you happen to see the girl right there. So while he was in CC, he continued on working in admissions and, uh, and then I remember him calling on this girl. She played on the basketball team with Brianna. So we went that game, and I remember wondering, is it that one, is it that one, is it that one? Well, he picked a good one. A couple things about Brendan's past rather than talk about titles or anything. He didn't cost us very much raising him. We didn't have to buy lunch tickets for him because when he'd go to school, he'd eat whatever every, everybody else didn't want on their plate. He went ahead and ate. So we had about four years of no lunch tickets to pay for. And uh, I remember when he was a sophomore, uh, each of my other girls kind of wanted a car, but we had some money saved up, and we were down in Iowa City, and I said, Brendan, you decide now. Do you want a car, or do you want this expensive music board? He wanted the music board, oh, the keyboard. I don't think I got that option. I <laughs> well, I made it. <laughs> it's your money, though. Well, the thing is, he got the keyboard, and he still drove our car. So he went to school. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to get a, a degree in worship ministry, but midterm somewhere there, he switched Old Testament history, and maybe he can follow on and say why he did that, because he continued to, uh, is in the process of obtaining his master's at Trinity College in uh, Chicago. Uh, so his background, is, he has some archeo archeological background, and so I invite you to have questions after church to go ask him because after the Sunday school class, several were asking him and uh, questions about that and some of the new findings that are quite interesting. And he seems to keep abreast on that. So some stuff you may not know about our son, Brendan, but otherwise, please welcome Brendan to speak to us today. Well, hey, thank you very much. Did I get this mic turned on all right, Tim? All right, good to go. Um, so yeah, it's, it's good to be back. It, I realized uh, how long it's been this morning. Jamie was handing out the communion, and I didn't know what to do with it because I go to this church where we actually hang on to it. We take it, we hang on to it, and I was just holding it here, and Jamie was trying to move the tray along. I was like, what do I do? And so um, it's been a while since I've been back, um, but it's good to be here. I'm really excited. Um, Dad mentioned a few of the things going on in our life. We have a lot of exciting things going on. Um, for those of you who don't know, my wife, Rachel, we just had the picture of her. Um, we're having a baby uh, this January, so we're pretty excited about that. And actually, we just found out this past week that we're going to have a boy. So um, uh, mom and dad, I think we're happy that we're carrying on the Lang name. I don't, <laughs> we have a bunch of girls. So, um, but we're, we're really excited about that. Uh, my wife and I, we attend a church in the Chicago land called Willow Creek North Shore. It's part of a, a very big, very different church than Madison. Um, uh, Willow Creek Community Church has about 25,000 people. Um, our, our particular campus has about 2,500. Uh, my wife is the student pastor at this church, um, which is just a really exciting thing. A lot of cool things going on in the youth ministry right there. Um, and then I'm a student at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, where I'm working on my master's in Old Testament and Semitic languages. Uh, I've been working on that for a long time, and I'm hoping to be done here this year. I'm writing my thesis right now on Genesis 5 in comparative literature, and I could 
tell you about that, but it would take about 90 pages worth of time. So we're not going to waste time on that um, this morning. What I uh, also want to say is I just want to say thanks to you guys. Um, uh, I'm very thankful Brian's not here. Well, I'm, I'm not thankful that Brian's not here. It might, might be better that Brian's not here, but I'm, I'm thankful for Brian uh, inviting me to come and uh, speak to you guys this morning, and I'm thankful to you all. Um, some of you I don't know. It's really cool actually to see a lot of new faces that I don't recognize, but for those of you who I do know, um, you guys have done so much for me over the years um, through your prayers while I've been away, but also just as a child growing up. Uh, this morning we talked about Psalm 77 and uh, talked about how uh, times from our youth, memories from our youth, sometimes help carry us uh, uh, along in the future. And uh, you guys have done a lot to carry me forward. You guys invested in me and impacted me in a lot of um, valuable ways. Anything that's good in me, I credit to you guys and to my family. Anything bad, I'll take the blame for that. But I'm just so thankful for this church. I have so many friends who grew up in churches, who have worked in churches and had very different experiences than I had at Madison. And so I just want to say thanks to you guys for really giving me such a good home uh, church in which to grow. And so with all that, I want to go ahead and transition to our sermon this morning. Um, This is a sermon I first prepared for our high school students at Willow. Um, This summer we had a sermon series uh, called Legacy in which we looked at the stories of people mentioned in Hebrews 11, which is kind of like a hall of fame of faith. And we wanted to look at how the stories of these people in Hebrews 11 might inspire our students and us to leave our own legacy of faith. And so this morning we're going to dig into the story of a person who left a remarkable legacy, a person who challenges us to believe that anyone can make a difference for God. But before we do... I want to ask you a question. Have you ever doubted the difference someone can make? Have you ever underestimated someone? When I was a sophomore at Nebraska Christian College, I played on the basketball team. And not only did I play on the basketball team, I was the captain of the basketball team, which sounds pretty cool until you realize that it was only because I was the oldest player on the worst team and and the smallest college in the lowest division of the lowest athletic association of all of America. But hey, I was still the captain, which, which was nice. And it wasn't too tough. All I had to do was beat out Brady. So uh, <laughs> anyway, that year I probably had something of an inflated sense of ego. So when our team first started practicing against one another, I remember looking around the court, sizing people up like basketball players do deciding in my mind who would make a difference for our team and who wouldn't. I looked over here and saw some guys who could shoot. I looked over here and saw some guys who could dribble, and I liked what I saw. And then in walked a guy named Raymond. Now, Raymond looked like a chump. It took just a few seconds to decide that this guy wasn't going to make a difference. He was wearing these dorky glasses. He had super long hair that came down to his waist. And most significantly, Raymond only had one hand. He didn't have a fully developed right hand, which would seem to be a problem playing basketball. So I had no expectations for this guy. I didn't believe he could make a difference on our team. I didn't even think he would make the team. And I was dead wrong. One-handed Raymond was the greatest basketball player I've ever seen. He could dunk, he could shoot lights out, he had the nastiest crossover I've ever seen. I later learned that he was a finalist for the Nike High School Athlete of the Year. And the only reason he wasn't playing basketball for a bigger school is because no one believed he could make a difference with just one hand. Raymond refused to let that hold him back. He was the best basketball player I've ever seen. And not only that, he was the best guitar player I've ever seen. He would take a a pick and tape it to his his arm and play with his fingers over here in the fretboard. He could actually, he could also solve the Rubik's Cube faster than anybody I'd ever seen, all with just one hand. I've never met a person who learned to overcome adversity quite like Raymond. Raymond taught me to never underestimate someone again. Raymond taught me that anyone 
can make a difference. Well, as I mentioned earlier this morning, we're going to dig into the story of someone who at first glance most would think couldn't make a difference. This person is a a woman named Rahab, and what I love about Rahab's story is that it challenges us to believe that no, no matter what our abilities, our history, our background, our gender, our ethnicity, or even our Bible IQ, any one of us can leave a legacy of faith. Anyone can make a difference for God. We can read Rahab's story in Joshua 2, so if you brought your Bibles, you can turn there now. I believe there's also text in the bulletins, which apparently have changed also. They don't have like the order of service on them. Um, So a lot of things are changing. I think we'll also have the text on the screen as well. Um, While you do that, I want to give you a little background on what's going on. So the book of Joshua tells the story about how the Israelites moved in and took possession of the land God had promised Abraham and his descendants something like 400 years earlier. Here's a map. You can see for a long time, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, which is this land to your left. Uh, and then they hung out in this deserty region, this, this area called Sinai for something like uh, 40 years. And then finally, uh, they were prepared to move in this land that God promised them. Here is another map, uh, a close-up of where they're at, where our story starts. So I, you can't read it, I'm sure. <laughs> but there's this... Uh, where the yellow line starts, it's a place called Shittim. This is where they're at. And across uh, where the yellow line goes, it goes across this river called the Jordan River, the Jordan River Valley Bed, and it ends up at this place called Jericho. Um, and that's where our story takes place this morning. I've got a photo of Jericho here. Uh, so you see this highway at the bottom of the screen. Just beyond the highway, this basically what appears to be a mound of dirt, that's the ancient city of Jericho. Beyond it, you can see these hills that ascend. This is the Jordan River Valley valley where Jericho is. Jericho is uh, just not really important for our message, but fun to know. Jericho is actually the oldest known city in the world. Um, Jericho is also the lowest point in the world. It is below sea level where it is located. And so uh, kind of interesting facts. And then we have these hills. These lead to uh, the Judean highland. And the key, what I want to show you guys, is Jericho was the key to taking the promised land. If the Israelites wanted to take this land that God promised them, they had to go through Jericho first. And so this is where our story starts, with a couple of spies and the Israelites hanging out at Jericho, or across the way from Jericho, to see what it would take to capture this city. So Joshua 2 starts this way. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. All right, hang on for just a minute. So we've got these Israelite spies from the people of God on a holy mission to spy out the land. And what is the very first thing they do? I told the Sunday school class, I want you to talk back, and I want you guys to talk back with me, because I'm used to teaching high school students, and they laugh and talk back. So what, what is the first thing the Israelites do? These spies. They went to the house of a prostitute, right? This is, this is, this is really surprising, at least it is to me. They, they don't do what spies normally do. They don't look for weak points in the walls. They, they don't try to infiltrate the military. No, the first thing they do is say, hey, let's go to the prostitute's house. That can't be a bad idea, right? This sounds more like what we would expect from U.S. Secret Service agents. Uh, (laughs) Not that that's never happened before, but this is what they do. And in fact, check this out. The word translated as stayed in this passage, this word often has a very different connotation. I've been trying to think of the tamest way to put this for you guys, and the best way I could put it is, Uh, This often refers to what we sometimes call the birds and the bees. Um, This this word was used to describe David's encounter with Bathsheba. This word was used to describe Jacob's encounter with Leah. And so uh, if you get my drift, uh, sometimes this word is used to refer to a little more than sleeping over at someone's house. Same with the word entered. Sometimes this word refers to what we call the birds and the bees. 
And so if you're reading along in Hebrew for the very first time, you're like, what on earth is going on? These spies are supposed to be on a mission for God, and the very first thing they do is shakav and bow in a prostitute's house. Now, in the end, I don't think anything sexual actually went on. They didn't actually sleep with Rahab. They just slept in her house. But it creates a sort of tension and irony in the story. It makes you, as a reader, ask, what is going on, and how is this story going to turn out? So let's keep on reading. Verse 2 says this, The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. All right, so we learn a little bit more about why these spies ended up in her house. It's because they were found out. Someone figured out their secret, that they needed a place to hide, which doesn't really make them look any better, right? Maybe they weren't interested in Rahab's professional services, but if you're found out this quickly as a spy, it just means you're not very good at what you do. These guys who were set up to be the heroes of the story are quickly turning out to be frauds. And because of their failure, the spotlight shifts to a different, unexpected character, Rahab, and the decision she would now make. And she basically has two options. She can risk her life by betraying the king and the city and hiding these spies. In fact, we know of a law in the Code of Hammurabi Students who are in world history class, you might have heard about this. The Code of Hammurabi, it was a law code uh, in Babylon, created about 1750 BC. This law code has this law that says, basically, a prostitute could be put to death for hosting or hiding spies. So Rahab could hide these spies and uh, put her own life in jeopardy. Or, on the other hand, she could turn the spies in. She could be safe for the meantime. She could be comfortable. But in the process, she would reject the unstoppable God and reject his plans for what he wanted to do in the promised land. What would you do in a situation like this? Would you ever take a risk in faith for God? A couple years ago, when we were preparing for one of our summer camps, we challenged our students um, at the church to invite their friends. We believe that camps provide some of the best opportunities for students to really grow in their faith. And so obviously we always want to get as many there as we can. But inviting friends to a thing like this when you're in high school can be really scary. And it's not really any different for adults either. It's the same as if we want to invite our coworkers to church. Anyway, there was this student in our group named Elton. And that year Elton was especially convicted that he needed to bring this one friend to church or to uh, camp. He had this friend who needed to hear a message about how much God loved him. This was a friend he had invited several times before, uh, but now they were seniors, and this was his last chance to go to camp. So Elton took a risk. Elton did something that we would never ask our students to do, but something Elton felt compelled to do nonetheless. He signed his friend up for camp without his friend even knowing. He paid the $400 fee, which is nothing to sneeze at as a high school student, and he said to his friend, your way to camp is paid. All you have to do is say yes. Now, this might seem like a small thing to some of you guys, but I, want to, I don't want you to miss the risk this meant for Elton. First, this meant possibly losing a friend, a lifelong friend, who, who, thought, who would have thought, this guy has just gone bonkers. He's lost his mind. I can't, I can't be friends with this guy. This meant possibly losing other friends in his friend group from high school who would inevitably find out about this and also decide that Elton has lost his mind. This also meant sacrificing something like 40 hours of work to pay a non-refundable fee for a friend to go to a camp who has over and over and over again said no. Now sure, Elton wasn't threatened with death or anything like that, but for a senior in high school, this was a risk. And here's what happened. That friend said yes. Through Elton, that friend got a glimpse of what grace is like. That friend got a glimpse of what God is like, that our way is paid, that all we have to do with God is say yes. 
And so that kid uh, said yes, and he became a Christ follower at camp that year. And here's the cool thing. Uh, after that, this kid, Chris, invited his sister Sandra to church, and she started to follow Christ. And after that, it just snowballed because Sandra, who was really popular in this school, 4,000 students in the high school, big place, she started inviting all her friends to church. And now, because Elton took this risk, invited and paid the way for this kid to come to camp, all these different students can say that we come to Student Impact at Willow Creek North Shore because of what Elton did. He left a legacy of faith that has lasted beyond him, even though he has now gone to college. And that's what we see here in the story of Rahab. God knocks on her door with a couple of spies, and she has a risky decision to make. Is she going to be for God, or is she going to be against him? So let's read on. Verse 4. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it is time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax that she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies in the roads that lead to the, leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is God in heaven above on the, and on the earth below. Rahab took a risk for God. Even though she was a Canaanite, even though she was a prostitute, she came to know the truth about this God that was leading the Israelites and made a decision to follow him, to hide spies for him, to risk her life for him. And what we learn later is that she and her whole family were spared and brought into the family of God. She was saved by her faith. Now earlier, I told you the book of Joshua as a whole tells a story about how the Israelites came in and took the land of Canaan, which had been promised to them by God. What I didn't tell you is that there are a lot of stories like this that we've discovered in the ancient world. Stories that we call uh, conquest accounts. Accounts of how different kings and nations would go out to different lands, conquer them, take them as their own, and then come back and write a book about this, about how great they are. My mentor um, at Trinity, his name is uh, Lawson Younger. He wrote his dissertation on these. It's called Ancient Conquest Accounts, if you uh, are interested in reading a bunch of these. Um, uh, and, and what he studied was how these conquest accounts are like and unlike what we see in the book of Joshua. And there are a lot of really interesting similarities, but I won't get into those. What I want to bring out for you this morning is how countercultural it was for the book of Joshua to include this story of Rahab. No other ancient conquest account includes or highlights the role of a woman quite like this, let alone a foreign woman, let alone a foreign woman prostitute. It almost reads like a joke. To an ancient person, this would have read more like Jay Leno or Jimmy Fallon. I mean, in a patriarchal, ethnocentric world, in a world which revolved around men and their love of country, who on earth would want to write a book about how a foreign female prostitute saved the day? How a foreign female prostitute was the hero? Who would write that book? Well, just one person. God. God did. In God's providential work of guiding the composition of the book of Joshua, God made sure Rahab got the attention she deserved. It's unique, it defies all expectations, and it teaches us that anyone can leave a legacy of faith. Anyone can make a difference for God. 
This is why she's remembered in Hebrews 11.31. You might see this on your bulletin, which says, By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Or also in James 2.25, which says, In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. And what I find really cool is that in the genealogy of Jesus, in Matthew 1, it says that Rahab is actually an ancestor of Jesus. Think of that. Jesus came through Rahab's line. And by the way, uh, like conquest accounts, genealogies of this day and in this place almost never mentioned women. Jesus' genealogy mentions four women, uh, Rahab, Ruth, Tamar, and Bathsheba. And these women, like Rahab, were female, obviously, foreign, and they all carried a sexual stigma. All of this teaches us a lot about what God thinks about marginalized people, and it teaches us about the legacy of faith anybody can leave for God. So let me bring this home to our current situation. In this room, I'm just going to assume there's some of you who doubt the kind of difference you can make for God. Maybe you feel held back by your gender. I want to talk to the ladies in the room for a little bit. Men, you should listen up though too. Um, first, I want to commend so many of you for the ways you've impacted me. Um, the legacy of faith uh, you left and imparted upon me. I could think of, I could tell so many stories about how you've inspired me. Like uh, Renee Hofert, uh, she, she probably won't remember this, but I remember a rowdy group of boys sitting in one of the classrooms downstairs learning uh, a song about how the books of the New Testament were in order. And uh, anyway, uh, somehow that song stuck with me. And, and even today, when I want to know where the heck the book of Titus is located, I just sing this song about how the, New Testament, the books of the New Testament are in order. Um, I also think about Julie Kriegel, and uh, she doesn't like that I brought her up. Um, and the fact that uh, she was my first boss, and she showed me what it was like to be a Christian leader in the workplace. And I could tell so many other stories about so many other women in this congregation who inspired me, who made a difference for me. But I also want to challenge you. I want to encourage you to think about how else God could use you, especially the younger women in the room, especially the younger girls in the room. Um, I think it's unfortunate that because of a few often misunderstood verses in Scripture, some of you girls might have the impression that church work, that ministry, is only the domain of men. For much of Rachel's life, my wife's life, this was the, imp the impression she had. And if I can brag on my wife for a minute, she took a risk when we moved out to Chicago. She applied to this church at which she had no connections. And now she's the student pastor leading a staff of four and um, overseeing a ministry of 350 middle school and high school students. And God is using her gifts in powerful ways. And it's all because she took a step in faith. And God can use you too in powerful ways if you'll just take a step of faith and follow him. Second, like Rahab, maybe some of you feel held back by your ethnicity. Now, given the demographics of Madison Church of Christ, we may not have um, a lot of people of a lot of different ethnic heritage, heritages, but we do know people in our lives uh, who might be, feel held back because of this. God knows the problems we're facing as a country with regards to racism, and I don't want to get in those, and I can't solve those here, but I can point to the fact that the story of Rahab reminds us that the family of God looks very different than you and me. People of all backgrounds and races can leave a legacy of faith. Third, maybe you feel held back by a sense of inadequacy. You're a new Christian, you don't understand the Bible, or you didn't grow up in a Christian home. Look, Rahab didn't know much about the God of Israel. She heard about the Exodus and that's it. She'd never heard the law, she likely grew up worshiping other gods, if there was ever a person who felt a sense of inadequacy, it was probably her. And yet, look at what she did. She took the little bit that she had, the little bit she did know, did the best she could with it, and she made a difference. And I'll tell you that some of the most faithful people I know don't know much of the Bible beyond the fact that God loves them in the best way that he could love us, 
And so they've made a decision to love other people the best way that they can. And that's about it. And I'll also tell you, because I read a lot of these books, that there are a lot of biblical scholars who aren't very uh, good. They, they don't get it. They know Scripture, but they aren't transformed by Scripture. So by knowing the Bible helps, but the kind of legacy God admires is not defined by Bible IQ. It's defined by steps of faith. Finally, maybe some of you feel held back by your past, by decisions you've made that continue to haunt you. You've done and said things you wish you could take back. Rahab's story is for you too. She didn't have everything figured out. She'd certainly made her share of mistakes. So it doesn't matter what you've done. God is willing to forgive you for that. What matters is what you do moving forward. This summer, I went with one of our church's student serving trips to Guatemala. And while I was in Guatemala, I met this guy named Michael. And Michael was the best. He was one of these guys you just love to be around. Um, he had a lot of jokes. He pulled pranks on the students. And um, it was all okay because he had a big heart and he, you knew that he cared about you. He was a stand-up guy, and everybody who went on this trip would agree that spending time with Michael was probably the highlight of our trip. Well, one thing we always do on serving trips is share our testimonies with one another, and because we spent so much time with Michael, we invited him to share his testimony with us. And what Michael shared with us was that he had made some really, really bad decisions in his life. He'd been in a gang and as a member of, the, member of this gang, he had, ha, he had to do some absolutely terrible things, things that would haunt most people for most of their lives. In order to escape all this, he found himself on the run. He lived in the jungle for a few years trying to avoid rival gang members who were trying to kill him. After several years of isolation, he one day returned to the city and met his soon-to-be wife. And his soon-to-be wife, she was a Christian. And as Christians do, she invited him to church and invited him to church, and he'd say no and no and no. And finally, he said yes. And it was there that he learned that he didn't have to let his mistakes define how he would live the rest of his life. He learned the beauty of the gospel, that God loved Michael so much that he didn't want him to bear the burden of the guilt that he carried with him every day, that God sent Jesus his perfect son, to bear that burden for him so that Michael could live a new and redeemed life. That by accepting Jesus, he could be forgiven for all the wrong he had done and go make a difference with his new life. And that's what Michael did. Today, Michael works. Uh, he's a mentor for young men who are at risk uh, in, of getting into gangs. He's, he wants these young men to avoid some of the mistakes they've made, that he's made, and he's making a difference in the world with the new life God has given him. He's leaving a legacy of faith. With your one and only life, you can do the same. It doesn't matter where you are in life, whether you're 10 years old or 80 years old, whether you work in a church or work on a farm, whether you're a student or whether you live in a nursing home, God can use any one of us to make a difference in this community and in this world. So my closing question for you is, how do you want to be remembered? Will you be more like the bumbling spies who moved around and left little faith, a uh, little, little sense of uh, their faith activity? Or will you be more like Rahab, who stepped out, put it all on the line, and took a risk in faith for God. I hope you'll choose the latter. Would you guys pray with me? Uh, dear Lord, we thank you so much um, for who you are. You are a, a good God, a loving God, a faithful God. And you're, you're a God that cares about all people. And you especially have an interest in marginalized people. And sinful people. And, and we'd all be helpless without you. God, we thank you for second chances. And God, I just pray that each one of us will take the risks, will take the opportunities you set at our front door, and we'll make the most of this life, living this world and this church and this community better than we found it. God, because that's really what you did for us. Thus we pray in your name. Amen.
Just stand and sing with us.